You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Tour de France in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today we are in Paris. Where are we, Lionel? I don't know, Francois. <laughs> where are we? <laughs> We're in Sormieu. Sormieu is a little, as a calanque, that's a little creek. Uh, it's in the middle of the. Uh, Well, it's actually in Marseille, in the very middle of Marseille, but you, you, you feel like you're somewhere else, don't you? I mean, and uh, it's, it's one of my favorite places on earth, to be honest. It's, uh, it's uh, that little creek, like you, you feel like you're in Crete or in kind of a desert island in the middle of the Mediterranean. And actually, you're, you're, you're about 25 minutes from Marseille's town center. I've never been to Crete, but I do feel like I'm in Crete. It's which absolutely is weird. stunning here. It's dark now, but as we came down from the top of the hill, the the view across the bay and the mountains on the side it's uh, it's a real I I thought Francois was exaggerating when he said how beautiful this place was but you you were co absolutely correct well Francois promised us he is from Marseille and he promised us a, a special meal on our final night together at the Tour de France the answer I was looking for from you Lionel was not Paris oh yes in the interest of full transparency we are not in Paris we are not going to Paris. <laughs> Um, but we do have Lionel's tale of the attack from Paris, and here it is. Let's fast forward to tomorrow, when the stage is finished, when I can recap what's happened. Dylan Groeneregen won the bunch sprint on the Champs-Élysées to give Team Lotto NL Jumbo their second stage win of the Tour, following Primoz Roglic's win in the Alps. It was a great finish to the Tour for the 24-year-old Dutchman, who'd been third in Bergerac and second in Poe, both on days when it looked like Marcel Kittel was unbeatable. But joy for the Dutch Lotto team meant disappointment for their Belgian namesakes Lotto Sudal. The German Andre Greipel was hoping to win on the Champs-Élysées for the third year in a row. Greipel had a record of winning a stage of every Grand Tour he's ridden going back to 2008, but it was not to be today, despite a strong finish over the closing couple of hundred metres. Edval Bozenhagen was third, although his tour was made by victory in Salon de Provence on Friday, and Nasser Bouhani was fourth, which made it a below-par tour for the Cofidis sprinter. Alexander Christophe of Katusha, covered in bandages after crashing hard and fast on a descent in the Alps, with a gutsy fifth. So Chris Froome confirms his fourth Tour de France title ahead of Rigoberto Uran and Roman Bardet. The Frenchman stayed on the podium thanks to his one-second lead over fourth-placed Mikel Lander, although the Spaniard did raise a smile with a comedy acceleration at the front of the bunch on the processional run into Paris. Sky had first and last on general classification, with the Welshman Luke Rowe taking the Lantern Rouge honours. Team Sky also won the team prize by a comfortable margin. Michael Matthews and Warren Barguil of Sunweb pulled on the green and polka dot jerseys respectively, making it a phenomenal tour for their team. Barguil was also somewhat controversially awarded the Combativity Prize by the jury. There was no doubt about Barguil's aggression, but as a winner of two stages and the King of the Mountains jersey, it would perhaps have been more appropriate to recognise Thomas de Ghent of Lotto Sudal, who attacked time and time again and spent more than a thousand kilometres in breaks. That's almost a third of the race. So, to honour de Ghent, the Cycling Podcast jury has awarded him the overall Pedaleur de Charme Prize, and we'll make sure we get a t-shirt to him shortly. Simon Yates of Orica Scott won the white jersey a year after his twin brother Adam had done the same thing. There were also a couple of high-profile retirements from Tour Action. Thomas Vauclair and Jaimo Zabeldia were both completing their 15th and final tours. Vauclair had been fourth in 2011 and won the King of the Mountains in 2012, but the dream of bowing out with a stage win was not to be. There'll no doubt be other riders who are reaching the Champs-Élysées for the final time, but they're arguably two of the highest profile. So, that was it, the 21st and final stage of the Tour. Well, that was a wonderful tale of the attack, Lionel, really a, evocative a, and really brought... final stage. Yeah, really brought <laughs> home to me just how exciting that final stage in Paris was. And it was great. And such a great winner as well. And it was, well, it was fantastic <laughs> to see, insert name here, win on the Champs-Élysées. Yeah. Joking aside, we should explain why we're not in Paris. Um, we've decided to forego the final stage this year for mainly logistical reasons. Um, the race has finished this evening in Marseille and uh, resumes tomorrow afternoon in, in Paris. And we've had long transfers up from the south to Paris in recent years, but this is 
a real difficult one. And um, because Francois lives in Marseille, we're losing one third of our team this evening. <laughs> wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be Francois. the same to go to Paris. We feel like we feel like we were we were cheating on Francois basically <laughs> by going to Paris <laughs> without him. There's a, there's a, there is a bit of a controversy there. Uh, uh, you know, if we're not going all the way to Paris, are we considered DNFs or not? I mean, well. That's, uh, are we DNFs? <laughs> but let's be honest about what Paris is for us. <laughs> well, I think we've covered this, haven't we? We've talked about this before. Uh, about, um, I think maybe in our road trip uh, for friends of the podcast. Oh, well, sign up as a friend of the podcast plug and there. listen to what I think about Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Recyclingpodcast.com. Um, we're, listen, we, we, what we did do on the penultimate day of the Tour de France in Marseille was we, when I say we, mainly mainly Francois, um, canvassed opinion from, we tried to get around all the teams, I don't think we man- quite managed that, but we got around almost all the teams, a rider, at least on every team, to tell us their favourite moment from this Tour de France. And here it is, here are their views and thoughts now. My name is Rigoberto Ran. I'm from Colombia, and I race for Cannondale Dre Pack. I think my favorite moment, it's, a, it's actually a paradox because it's tomorrow and it hasn't happened yet. My name is uh, Johan Ofredo. Uh, I'm in uh, the team Wanty Group Gobert. It's a Belgian team. And uh, my best moment in this Tour de France, I think it was uh, the second stage of, of the two when I, I rose with uh, Taylor Finet and uh, it was possible to, to win the stage. And it was a great moment because uh, for us, uh, it was uh, our, our first Tour de France, and it was just like uh, a dream. And uh, it was behind uh, uh, the dream and the reality, and it was something great. But each moment was was great on this Tour de France. Uh, even when uh, I was sick, okay, it's it's very very hard. But when you cross the line after uh, after uh, suffering during. Uh, Five, six hours, few, uh, two, three, four days. It's, uh, it's incredible the feeling, and uh, I have no words to say what I feel. Gauthier, Cyril, meilleur moment, uh, la victoire de Romain. Uh, My best moment Paris. was Romain's victory in Perigou. Uh, I was in the break at the front, hoping to act as a relay point or go for the stage victory. Unfortunately, I was a little tired in the finale, but Romain took over and won the stage. It's my eighth Tour de France, and I was lucky to share lots of victories with my teammates. Ouais, ben je suis Yuki Alashiro, équipe Barem Melida. Je suis content de passer à circuit de Spa. I was happy to ride on the Spa Francorchamps circuit because I'm a motor racing fan, especially Super GT and Formula Two, because one of my best friends, Nobuharu Matsushita, is a driver and won in Barcelona. When I rode on the Spa circuit, it was nice because I'd seen it many times on TV. For me, it's to work very hard. I am such an over in the sky. Uh, one day strong, one day no. Okay. Yes. For me, it's very important in support. Every time, every day, a team, a Chris. Okay, yes. The Chris win, uh, very happy, all team. Alors, uh, Perry Kemener, Team Direct Energy. Mon meilleur moment, uh, c'est bien sûr la... My best moment was for sure Lillian Kalmajan, because I contributed to it, and it worked the way we had planned hoped and looked for and as a result will remain the best memory for me. The best moment will be tomorrow when I finish this. Jay McCarthy, I ride for Bora Hansgrohe. It's been good, um, of course when I was finished fifth in stage, whatever stage it was, that was nice. So and uh, also the victory with Peter Sagan in the first week was a good team moment and we might be able to uh, Enjoy another one now as Body's still leading the time trial. So we're all in there watching it and uh, we're hoping for, uh, for a good outcome at the end of the stage. Uh, Nicolas Aide, équipe uh, Cofidis. Uh, my best moment on the tour this year was the stage to best moment on the tour was the stage to Izawad when we were in the break with Danny Navarro and Dimitri Kleiss. I did a lot of work for Danny and I took a lot of pleasure in riding at the front after struggling for 10 days with my bronchitis. Hello, I'm Jurgen Rulands from Lotus et al. And my highlight is tomorrow on the Champs Elysees. I'm Michael Matthews and I ride for Team Sunweb. And the highlight of the tour so far, I think, would be uh, the stage into Rodez. It was really a stage that we had targeted. And um, yeah, we, I, we knew the finish from, uh, from 2015 Tour de France. I finished that stage with uh, four broken ribs, unfortunately, and uh, didn't get to really contest it. So 
yeah, I think going back there for the second shot at it and um, the way we won it as a team, I think it was really special and uh, something I'll really remember for a long time. Donc Laurent Pichon, équipe fortunée au Oscaro. Et mon meilleur moment du Tour 2017, c'est mon échappé le premier jour. My best memory was my breakaway on the first day on the road from Düsseldorf to Liège. My first Tour de France, I was the first attacker in this tour. I'd gone hoping to take the King of the Mountains jersey. It didn't work, I was second. But it was super in front of such a great crowd. I started riding at the age of 13, and this was a justification for all of those years. My highlights have been uh, three breakaways uh, during these three weeks, so that's about it. Hi, I'm Frederick Buckhardt, Team Monte Group Gobert. How many kilometers off the front do you think? Uh, 550, yeah. That's it. <laughs> and today, an extra 22 and a half. Hola, eh? <laughs> soy Jesús Herrada, ciclista de Movistar Team, y... El mejor momento será mañana en París al acabar. My best moment will be the finish in Paris. Another nice moment was finishing the stage in Chambéry, as it was so hard. My highlight was starting in Düsseldorf. It's uh, quite an experience to start in your own country, the Tour de France, and it was uh, really huge. Hello, I'm uh, Paul Martens. I'm from Team uh, Lotto and El Jumbo. Of course, the the victory from uh, my teammate Primoz Roglic. Uh, we had also some nice days with the sprinters. We didn't get the victory with Dylan. We have uh, one chance more tomorrow. And uh, that would be really nice because that you really achieve with the whole team. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Tour de France in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Thank you very much to Rafa, our main sponsor. We are very grateful to them. Without Rafa's support, we wouldn't have been here at the Tour de France. Um, it's, a, it's a jigsaw, isn't it, Lionel? And Rafa provide a, a very large piece of that jigsaw. Science and Sport also, very grateful to them. And friends of the podcast. And uh, a little reminder that coming up this week, we have a few things for friends of the podcast for everybody not for just friends of the podcast we have the cycling podcast Femina coming out at the start of the week on La Course uh, later in the week we've got the second part of our road trip around France which is sort of behind the scenes stuff going to be recording a bit more of that tonight I think and then we've got a day on the tour in the Cannondale Drapac team car I spent a day in the team car and uh, that will be a friends special uh, sign up as a friend of the podcast at the cyclingpodcast.com £10 for the year. You can sign up for previous years as well and access lots of exclusive uh, documentary style podcasts that we've produced over the last few years and uh, your support is very much appreciated. Um, we've heard what some of the riders' favourite moments are. What are ours? Lionel? Oh, sorry, you're pointing at Francois. Francois? Well, first of all, the, 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 the funny thing is we, we explain in this podcast why we are not going to Paris, and, and actually most of the riders answered that their favorite moment was Paris because, well, for the wrong reason very often, because the tour is over and it suffered so much, they were so proud of making it all the way. So I'm not going to say like a rider should, you know, my favorite moment is when it's over, because my favorite moment would be now, but... Um, I guess my favorite moment for many, many reasons was Piragud, the, st the stage to, Pira put to Piragud, because it looked really, um, well, unpromising. Well, 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 it was promising on paper, but when we got to, the, to Piragud, as my two partners in crime would tell you, we were asked to park a long way from the press tent, because there was, well, probably the only tent on the tour this year. And we had to work to walk quite a long way to the press stand, and so it, it's it's you know it sounded and looked quite unpromising. But actually, the fact that we were parked that far from uh, the press stand made me actually walk up that 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 climb, very short climb, 500 meters climb. That was probably the the, the 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 highlight point of the Tour de France this year. Only 500 meters of tarmac. Leading to a you know mountain airport where a James Bond movie had been shot, and and just walking up that course, I, I realized how terribly daunting the Tour de France was because when I got to the top of the, that climb, I was exhausted and I was uh, I was walking, and, and and I was thinking that you know some guys like two hours later would 
ride. You had a real sense of the steepness yeah, of the slope. Yeah, exactly. We would ride all the way up that uh, that climb after almost 200 k's of previous riding and all the things. So I, it, was a, it was really a great moment. The second thing I did on Piragud is I I actually nicked um, a slice of black pudding off Lionel <laughs> on the same day. But I, I have an excuse for that because I was I was so exhausted after climbing, you know, uh, uh, that, uh, walking up that last climb that I was starving and I really needed something to eat quickly. Uh, <laughs> That was a highlight for me as well. Yeah. The third thing about Piragut is, is the Solomon of the same buffet was terri- absolutely terrific. And uh, there was, the, well, the race itself was absolutely exceptional. And there was, there was the last thing, I don't know if I, if I need, well, if I should say that, but you might have seen my face on Twitter and on the other social networks trying to mimic uh, Thomas Vockler, you know, tongue, <laughs> tongue grimace or whatever it is. Uh, I, I made a total failure out of it, but I made a total fool of myself there. <laughs> well, this is where you were interviewed for the InCycle program, yeah. wasn't I, it? I was interviewed by the InCycle program. And, and well, and the, the, the reason why I look so terrible on the, in this, in this you know, li- little clip, and, and, a, and I think, because I haven't seen it yet, but I, I looked apparently so good on the, the interview was that actually I'm afraid of heights as these heights, two guys yeah. n- know and I was actually uh, asked to you know answer the question to an insightful uh, on the edge of a ravine and I, and I was terrified <laughs> the only thing that made me kind of you know not lose my composure is that the in- interviewer um, Flavia is uh, how could I say well she, she's, a, she's a very uh, nice uh, you know um, Kind and 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 well, she 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 she, she managed to uh, you know handle me uh, in, in such fashion that, that I made a fool of myself and I liked it very much. So everything about Pierre Good was uh, and was good. From a racing point of view, it was the one moment in this tour where we've seen a little chink in Chris Froome's armor and wondered right. whether the race might that, open up. That's right. There might be the moment when maybe. Uh, you know, Chris Room started to to be on the way and on the on the way down. And, it, and if you know, if it sounds sometimes like we don't <laughs> applaud Chris Room for his incredible achievements, it's because even though he's not been in the others the whole time and his lead has been quite small, there has been a sense in this tour that you know that he is he was in control. And I think seeing a, a crack was was exciting for because what we want to see is not a particular rider win. I wouldn't want to see any rider being dominant. I, you just want to see an exciting race, and and that and it's right. not any kind of anti Chris Froome feeling. Chris Froome is a is a kind of model champion in a lot of ways. If I can make a last point about about what you just said, and uh, and to all the listeners who sometimes think we or I personally could be an anti Froome, uh, what's what's great about sport in general and about human you know endeavors in general is not strength. His weaknesses and the way you get over the uh, over those, to see that you know at times Chris Froome has weaknesses, some that he has flaws, and and that it makes him even more human and it makes his performance his performances even more interesting and and and, and you know and well and admo- uh, admirable you know. So uh, if we highlight from time to time the weaknesses of Chris Froome, it's not because we don't like him, but it's become it's exactly the opposite. It's because this guy has flaws. That is, is a great champion. Yeah, well, I think just on that, just from what Chris Froome said in his press conference this evening, he was asked whether there should be some kind of budget cap to try and curb... We're, we're talking on, on Sunday, remember, Lionel? No, we're not talking... People know we're not talking on Sunday because we've told them we're in Marseille on Saturday already. <laughs> For goodness sake, we've got through the tour without having Sorry, an I argument. About let's, that. let's let's <laughs> see. We've got five minutes. Just just let's see if we can get through it without one <laughs> argument. That would be a record. But um, Chris Froome made the point last night, as you're listening to this on Sunday. Um, uh, uh, he was asked whether there should be some kind of budget cap to curb Team Sky's power in terms of have, uh, being able to load their team with so many strong riders, who some of whom would be uh, GC contenders perhaps in, in other teams. And uh, he said something about how if there was a, a budget cap, it would de- disincentivize success. And, and I thought that was quite an interesting way of kind of turning that argument around 
and looking at it from the point of view of his own self-interest, really. Um, I'm not saying that, that, that uh, you know, Team Sky have done anything wrong, because they haven't, but there's no doubt that Team Sky are able to outmuscle everybody in a financial sense. But what's really interesting is that the two other riders on the podium, Rigoberto Uran of uh, Cannondale Drapak, Roman Bardet of AG2R, ride for two of the smallest budget teams um, in the World Tour. Obviously, the wildcard teams have smaller budgets again. And what the, the big question is how the other big budget teams have completely failed to mount a challenge, really. Um, not just Astano. I mean, Astano have had a decent fist with Fabio Aru, and he was uh, ill in the second half of the race and was clearly coming down from quite a peak in the first half of the race when he looked like he was going to be the biggest challenger to Froome. But when you look at the financial muscle of some of the other teams... Um, Katusha, for example, absolutely nothing to offer in the Tour de France. Um, I mean, uh, about a quick step, Floors have got the split between Dan Martin and Marcel Kittel, so they've got more bases stages. to cover. Well, which is they've they've, they've had a pretty good tour. They've had a very good tour, but in terms of challenging Team Sky for the yellow jersey, you know, <laughs> their efforts are compromised somewhat. Um, you look at it and think, well, the other teams need to, if you're going to fight Team Sky head to head, they need to take the same approach as Team Sky and that's one of the things that AG2R has actually done this year and we've, we have talked about that in the podcast. They've B done it with... BNC a were probably the worst failure if you look at it. Well, they were very unlucky, of course, Richie Port out of the race but then, you know, very little else to offer once Port was, uh, you know, had crashed out. No plan B. You mentioned Rigoberto Ran. He finished... Uh, second in the Tour de France which is a fantastic result for a team that Jonathan Vortis has also often claimed has actually the lowest budget in the world tour um, I spoke to Charlie Wigelius uh, the sports director at Canada Drapak I have to say he was he was shaking as I spoke to him I mean I think the, the tension of the last few days had been huge for that team and I, I sensed that around the team and I asked him about that and here's what he said in Marseille, reflecting on Rigoberto Uran finishing second at the Tour, here is Charlie Wigelia. Charlie, you've won the Giro with Ryder Hegedal a few years ago, but it's, it has been a difficult time for, for the team at, at times since then. What does it mean to finish Tour de France with a rider in second place? I, I think it's enormous for the whole organisation. Um, I think the team, we work really well. We do a lot with what we've got. And uh, every so often, when things fall in the right place, the, we can come up with really big results. And we've seen that then, and we've seen it now again. I mean, what have you learned from this tour? Was it just, you know, when, when things have been difficult, that you had Rigoberto Ran leading the team at the Giro last year, and it didn't work out for him? Has it just been that, you know, everything's kind of gone well at the right time, and Iran in particular has managed to prepare well for the tour and really show what he's capable of? Yeah, I, I think for us it's a combination of, of several things all just falling into place. I mean, I've said about Rigoberto over these weeks when people have been asking me that he's always had a really high caliber as a GC rider, but never got really a clear run at a race without a hiccup or an illness or an incident. And despite that, finished twice second in the Giro. Um, I think the route was great for him this year. He never got sick, he never had a, a hiccup or anything like that. And um, he had a really, you know, strong build-up and things just fell into place and he never made a mistake. It's been tense though, hasn't it? I've, be, I've sensed a lot of nerves around the... Uh, normally a, a relaxed team, fair to say, a very open yeah. team, but there has been a bit of tension. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, anybody in cycling, you spend much more time losing than you do winning even the most successful people. But we've had so many near misses and so many banana skins, you know, lying around corners for us that uh, it, 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 it wears on your nerves a bit, or at least it did me. Um, but we kept positive and we kept working and we never really let the sort of growing buzz around the team get to us. I think we never had a any kind of inferiority on this uh, complex on this race but neither did we start doing things that were beyond our scope strategically we just did our race in the best way that we could and and like I say Rigo never put a foot wrong um, until, until that last corner there but um, were you following him in the car at that point I, I was and that was a little bit uh, 
intense, but um, even that worked out well. So, so what? What now? I mean, the team has got a new sponsor for next year. It's got a lot of riders out of contract at the end of the year. Do you see big changes? Will you still have Iran next year? Yeah, I, th- I think I'm um, sure. As an organisation, we'd like to grow, but also, I think the way this team works is is valid, and we don't need to just throw that you know throw that away now just because we finished second in the tour and we have a lot of good riders that we've worked very hard on and I don't think we need to revolutionize the way that we work to to keep growing I think we've always done the right thing I said that when we were winning less uh, and I still say the same now I think we work as a group in a really good way and I think we should continue doing that it's well documented that this team you know doesn't have one of the biggest budgets in the sport you're up against the might of Sky who you know Landers just off the podium Fiakovsky's almost won the time trial and Chris Froome has, mm. has won the race so to finish second to that team it, it's a victory isn't it? No winning's winning <laughs> um, but for sure for, for our organisation we've done a lot with uh, with not so much financially but I think that you know what we like financially we make up with good people Become a friend of the cycling podcast for just 10 pounds and listen to exclusive episodes. See thecyclingpodcast.com for more information. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science and Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. Very grateful to them indeed. And of course, you get 20% off Science Sport products at scienceandsport.com, entering the code CPOD20. Sorry about the background noise here. It's uh, Orla Shinoui and friends telling ridiculous stories. I think you can probably pick up a bit of that. She's got quite a penetrating voice, hasn't she, Orla? Um, anyway, Lionel, we've heard France. There, there we go. We've heard Francois's highlight of the tour. What's your highlight of the tour? I think racing highlight is uh, stage nine, Nantois to Chambéry. Um, one of those days when uh, the Tour de France threw up about five stories in 25 minutes and you had to really sift through all of the different things that had happened. Um, we always talk, you know, as the race has wound down, people have been asking on social media, do you think this has been a good tour or a, a bad tour? And everyone wants to know, how, you know, how we should weigh it up against previous races, I guess. And has it been entertaining? But that particular day was one of the most extraordinary single days I've known on the Tour de France because we had so many things happen very, uh, you know, back to back. There was Chris Froome's mechanical problem, the comedy of Fabio Aru riding underneath Chris Froome's arm as he had his arm in the air to, to call for technical support. Um, technical support? <laughs> like, not just the, <laughs> the IT guys coming to reboot his computer. He was calling the hotline, you know. <laughs> he was. <laughs> Turn it on and off again, Chris. It'll be fine. <laughs> um, and then, of course, Froome comes back to the group. Um, as he's coming back to the group, Richie Port, his very good friend and former teammate, and now rival, of course, slows the group down and they allow Chris Froome to get back on. And then there's a whole kind of discussion. Should they wait? Shouldn't they wait? Should they wait? And so on. And then just as we're um, getting to grips with that, a little video emerged on social media that my friend Simon Ricketts uh, sent me um, by email where it appeared that Chris Froome had tried to steer Fabio Aru across to the edge of the road a little bit, possibly as a bit of a, you know, a warning, a, you know, don't you attack me when I've got a problem. Of course, we'll never get to the bottom of that because they both played that all down. But th- while we were digesting all of that, then there was a, terif- a terrible crash on the descent for Richie Port and Dan Martin. And so the whole nature of the story that afternoon changed one way, then the next, then another way, then another way. And that night we had the job of trying to sift through all of that, turn it into a podcast, which is what we're here to do. That really got the adrenaline going that night. I think that was one of our, I think that was our best podcast of the tour. And in terms of our audience, that was our highest rated podcast. So, um, I would say that's the day that when in five years' time somebody says, what do you remember about the 2017 tour? I'll remember that day. A bit like Von Tu last year. The, these are the stages that, as you say, produce so many storylines that you cannot actually process them all at the time. And it's why the Tour de France is such a rich, a rich event for 
journalist to, to go back and revisit because it moves on and the next day you're talking about something else and you move on very quickly and, and forget about all the things happened. I mean Rigoberto Uran and his gear trouble, Warren Bargale and his near miss, Roman Bardet, his attack, Astana's cooperation with uh, Chris Froome in, in the closing kilometers to chase down Roman Bardet. All these things when a tour was decided by seconds as this one was have an impact on the on the eventual outcome. But your point, Richard, about how the history of the tour gets written not while the race is going on, but afterwards, is so true. And we got a little hint of that in the press conference in Marseille tonight slash last night um, <laughs> when Chris Froome was asked by Peter Cousins, I think it was. Um, he Peter Cousins asked you on the stage of Peragud when uh, you felt you, you you faltered in the final kilometre. Did you feel bad? In the lead up to that, you know, did you did you know that that slight crack was coming? And, and obviously, if you'd asked him that on the day or after, you know, even four days later or five days later, Chris Froome would not have answered that question. But now the race is won, and uh, he's, you know, he's, he's home and dry. He he basically gave a little hint and said, "Well, yeah, I knew I was on a bad day. I possibly got my fueling wrong, and so on and so forth." And so the stories about the the. Fabio Aru attacking. He'll give an interview to an Italian paper at some point, maybe over this winter or maybe further in the future, saying, well, yeah, I did know Chris had had a problem. and I, Or maybe not, you know, but he will tell the truth at some point when the pressure's slightly turned down a bit and we'll then look back on the tour with yet another perspective. And Absolutely. You know, when people are saying, has it been a good race? Has it been a, a boring race? I mean, it's never boring. There's I a mean, lot that goes on. That, that, this is why we love cycling, that there's a lot that goes on that we, we don't see and we don't hear about at the time and, and, and it unfolds later and it, it comes through speaking to these guys and the, the actors who, who are there and, and, and who have the... The actual, you know, the first-hand accounts. My highlight of the tour was the first stage in the Alps when I was in the Cannondale Drapak team car. Always a privilege, always a, a fantastic experience, but we were particularly lucky this year. I mean, that sounds like a, a, a strange thing to say because they had a, a, it was a bad crash early on, um, but there was a lot of drama, and then they got two riders in the brakes, so that meant that the team car that I was in went through the peloton and, and behind the brake. And going through the peloton, I've done it in a, on a motorbike in the Tour de France before. It's a nerve-wracking experience, but doing it in a car was a very odd experience because um, you're, you're riding, you're riding, you're driving on narrow, twisting roads through the peloton with you know the couple of vehicles in our little convoy, and it's not easy to do because the riders are you know filling the road and they're moving according to the riders in front of them and. Peloton has its own rules and will not just, they don't just all move over to the right to let us through on the left. And you're, you're surrounded by riders and, and in that moment you see the Peloton close up and you see riders who, I, I think I mentioned the other day, you know, there were, we were driving along and for a long while we were stuck behind, beside Johan Ofredo, who had spoken to that morning and given him a Peddler de Charme t-shirt and it was all very jolly. And then an hour or so later, I'm driving alongside him in a car, sitting there, um, and he's there, and you can see the effort, you can see the the, the stress on his body, or the seriousness of what he's doing, um, the fear because it's a big mountain stage, um, all that, the high spirits of earlier had gone, and it, it it's just quite sobering really to to see them clo uh, that that close up in action doing what they do. We eventually made our way through the bunch and followed the, the break. And it was, uh, it's not something I do all that often at the tour. We've been in team cars at other races, but at the tour, everything's on a bigger scale. And uh, the, the view that you get from there is it, it, it's, it's, it's different to, to what we see most of the time on, on the TV screens. And, and especially when we came up to the crash, and I mentioned this, I think, the other day, that you know when you see it on TV, it, it's sanitized. When you get you arrive on the scene minutes after it's happened and you see the riders on the road, the noises they make, the, the carnage, the, the broken bikes and the bottles and all the rest of it, you have a real sense of how raw that is and, and it, it, it makes quite an impression on you. And uh, So my day in the, in the, with the Cannondale Drapak team in the car, uh, was the, that, those are the memories that are most vivid, I think, of this tour.
Yeah, well, to, to be honest, I mean, that, that's the fascinating thing about the Tour and cycling in general that make it such a special sport, very different from many other sports. You, that you, 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 you just said this is what it's really like, you know, being in the car, but it's not what it's really like. The Tour is, is, is real, you know, as a, rea a different reality for everybody involved in it, from the guy putting the barriers on to, uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the speaker at the, the, the finish line, to the podium girls, you know, like it or not, you know, doing their, their job, and to the 198 or, you know, nearly 200 uh, riders in the race, they, they each live a reality that's different, and s which means there are millions of stories of to stories. be told mm. about uh, about the tour and they're all the reality of the tour and that's what you know we're trying kind of to convey for the signing podcast to, to, to have these all these different versions of the same story into into as you said like a kind of big jigsaw puzzle that in the end is the tour I well it was not one of, one of my highlights but on on the stage to Serge Chevalier I, I I went into the technical zone and there, there, there was a AG, AG2R track And uh, there was this y a young rider I like. Well, he's not so young now anymore, but this rider I like a lot. It's perfect teammate, Cyril Gauthier. Always at the front, always fighting hard. He, he, he was a very good amateur rider. He was, he was you know, European champion, uh, road champion, and now works for Romain Bardet. He was there lying stark naked in, in a plastic tub, you know, on, on the day of that, of that stage. At the back of the of, of the, the team's lorry, talking to his uh, sports director and asking him who is in the lead, who won the stage, where was I, where did I finish? This guy lived a, a stage of you know suffering, working hard for his teammate, and and at the end of the day, he he, he comes to the finish line, he has no clue what's going on, you know. And well, we had a similar exchange in the in the team car on the, the, the same stage, Cher Chevalier where Pierre Roland was really in a bad way that day and he was in the, the Gruppetto and talking to the, and finding out from the team car what had gone on and yeah fascinating to to see you know how engaged he was in the race how curious he was how um, you know so much was at stake on that day for his teammate Rigoberto Uran and he wanted a sort of blow by blow account of what happened and and he got that and, and those guys who are detached from it in, in that moment are still so heavily invested in it and it's yes yeah, it's, it's as you say i think that that's the thing that the 190 odd riders each has a different story every day which we can't even hope to to cover and that's what makes it so rich it's a good moment to end it is but before we go we we, we well let's have a little personal my personal moment of the tour i i particularly enjoyed the 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 meal and the wine in nuit saint georges that was That was very good. Um, I was gutted to miss the very good meal you had, the two of you had in Rodez. Um, but I think the, uh, it, it's reached the, the end of our Tour de France journey. We've not made it to Paris, unfortunately, but we're, we're pulling out like FDJ. Um, <laughs> we're, we're There's only three <laughs> riders. <laughs> yeah. We're leaving the cycling podcast with no riders going to Paris this year, um, but for very good reasons. Um, but before we go, Francois, I just want to say that it's been an absolute pleasure uh, from start to finish travelling with you and working with you on uh, this Tour de France. Uh, too many highlights to remember. I will always think of the back seat of my car as the nest. Um, <laughs> I'll try to keep the nest in my car tidy for whoever may travel in it. Um, I've learned so much about France and about the race and I've got to know you and uh, can now count you as a, as a friend and I hope that we can do this again um, next year. But as a little token of our appreciation I know you can buy this all over uh, Marseille, <laughs> and it's not perhaps the most original of gifts, but you can hear the clanking. Oh. Francois, we've got you a bottle of Ricard pastis to enjoy over the rest of the summer. And before we go, we've also got one for our friend Simon the photographer, <laughs> because we know that Simon's his, basically his ambition in life is to be like Francois. So, so Simon... Thank you uh, for your help also on the tour. Well, I would echo uh, 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 Lionel's words exactly, Francois. It's, <laughs> yeah. been an, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> Simon and Francois are, are, are cheersing their bottles um, of Ricard. But no, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, it's been fantastic to, to travel and work with you. And uh, you've been a very good addition to the Cycling Podcast team. 
Let's do it again. Yeah. Well, who knows? Merci beaucoup. I mean, yeah. I don't know what to say. I, I, I really didn't believe I, I could survive three weeks in France with a Scot and, a, <laughs> and, and, and an, well, you know, English and an Irishman, Irishman. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. And, uh, well, it was actually pretty easy to do, you know. So, uh, yeah, how about another one? <laughs> we'll take that. We'll take that, Francois. <laughs> Thank you to you, Richard. Thanks, Lionel. Thanks to you, Orla. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Thank you, Lionel. <laughs> thank you, listeners. Thank you, listeners. Thank you very much, listeners, who Bye. have listened in record numbers this year, and we're very grateful to that. We'll be back soon. Thank you. That completes our coverage of the 2017 Tour de France. Richard and I would like to thank our sponsors, Rafa, Science in Sport, and Niederberg Wines, because without their support, we would not be able to produce the cycling podcast. We're so grateful to Francois Thomaso for joining the team this year and would like to thank our other contributors and guests, including Daniel Free, Orla Chenoui, Chiros Gondumilio and everyone else who made an appearance on the show. We'd be lost without our fantastic production team back in the UK. They turn the shows around quickly every night, correcting our mistakes, making us sound better than we are. So thank you to Tom Wally, John Mooney and Adam Bowie, as well as Paul Scoynes and Will Jones. Thank you to Simon Gill, our photographer and travel companion, whose help is invaluable, not just in a practical sense, but in helping to keep morale high. His pictures are frequently among the very best too, so if you get a chance to check him out on Twitter, he's Simon Gill Photo. Thank you to Nick Christian and Jonathan Rowe for producing our email newsletter and helping with our social media efforts, and to David Luxton, our sponsorship liaison and director of Sportif. Most of all, thank you to you, all of our listeners, We appreciate all your feedback by email and social media, and we do read everything we're sent, although it can be tricky to find time to reply during the tour. But your messages, comments and feedback are most welcome. We'd particularly like to thank our friends of the podcast. Just as with our sponsors, your support means that we can cover the three grand tours the way we do. So that's all from the Tour de France. We'll be taking a short break, although there will be plenty to listen to between now and the Vuelta a España, which starts in Nîmes on August the 19th. We'll speak to you then.